Thank you, Elaine. Uh, yes, I am a wildlife biologist. I work for the state of Vermont. I've worked for the state of Vermont since 1990. Um, prior to that, I went out to school in Wyoming to get a bachelor's degree. Ended up getting my master's and staying a while longer. I was 14 years in Wyoming before I came back. Uh, but I am a graduate of Windsor as well, and uh, I'm happy to, to be back here uh, today. Um, so I'm going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, and that's black bears. It appears there's quite a bit of interest about the Hanover bear, and so I might mention that, indeed, uh, you might have seen the, the Valley News recently. Uh, there was a headline just yesterday, I, I think, about the Hanover bear. Um, that's an interesting bear in that she was relocated uh, from Hanover after she and her yearlings got into quite a bit of trouble. She's been a backyard bear. Um, and so we know that she'd been there for at least six or seven years in Hanover, uh, raiding bird feeders, getting into garbage, but not causing too much problems until her last litter, as they became yearlings and they, she, they were breaking up from her, they started breaking into houses. And at, at that point, they tried some other things, uh, tried to get people to clean up their garbage, to secure their garbage, and take down the bird feeders so the bears could live there. Uh, that didn't work. They weren't successful, so they ended up um, taking the, the new litter of cubs from her last spring, um, giving those to Ben Killam to raise and release this spring. They'll actually go out into the wild, while a female was moved up into northern New Hampshire, uh, up near Pittsburgh. And she didn't stay there very long. Uh, she moved south, and she was in the Lancaster area for a while, and then she moved across the river into Vermont. She went around Lake Willoughby. She went north up near Newport. We thought she was going to head into Canada. Then she came back down, crossed back over New Hampshire for a few weeks, and then came back to Vermont. And she's been going up and down the state since then, uh, putting on hundreds and hundreds of miles, uh, moving at night. She's got a, a GPS satellite collar, so we're able to keep track of her. And at first, when I reported uh, to my headquarters that we had a bear that was a problem bear in New Hampshire that was in Vermont, they weren't real happy about it. But I told them, I said, it has not caused any problems that we know of in Vermont while it's been here. It's been traveling at night, at least 10 miles a, a night, a lot of times more. And then uh, during the daytime, it finds a place to hole up and nobody sees it. So we had absolutely no reports uh, of that bear. We had one report uh, from Newport where it went through somebody's yard but didn't cause any, any problems at all. But otherwise, we were just amazed that this bear that was such a problem in Hanover uh, was going up and down the state of Vermont and hadn't been a problem here. She ended up uh, stopping after our first big storm in November, toward the end of November. She stopped in North Pomfret. Uh, at, a, at a farm, and she denned up on a hillside above it. Uh, the state of New Hampshire wanted to see if she would make it back to uh, Hanover or not, plus we thought we were getting some valuable information from her, and so it's decided to change out the batteries on her collar and keep her collared. So we visited her den in March uh, with the landowner. They came along to, to see that. Um, we changed out the collar. Uh, put her back in the den and left before she woke up again. And a couple weeks later, she left the den, uh, went south to Woodstock and spent a few days around the town of Woodstock. Um, and at that time, she was seen in somebody's backyard. And so there are some pictures. It, it came out on, on the web. Um, and that's how the Valley News heard about it, and they asked to do a story. Um, and so that's where the story came out. She's traveling again. She, uh, as of yesterday, my last report on her, she was down around Ludlow. Last year, she went through Ludlow and actually continued going west and went as far as Castleton, Rutland and Castleton, before uh, turning back. Um, she did spend some time in Heartland, actually, as Elaine said, right behind our house between there and the elementary school. Um, we're real curious because bears just don't travel uh, so much. They might travel for a food source, but she's not looking just for food. 
We think she's still trying to get back to Hanover, and we think her compass must be a little messed up because she hasn't <laughs> been able to find her way. So we're just fascinated to see uh, what she ends up doing. Um, so that's kind of it on the Hanover. Is she staying out of there. trouble now because she doesn't have any cubs with her? You know, I don't know. Um, she made a living in the woods around Hanover, but also hit the bird feeders and garbage if it was left out. Um, we expected when she was moved that she would just be a problem somewhere else. That's been our experience. When you move a bear, it's just a problem. So we don't normally move bears. It's only because the governor got involved in this case um, that that one actually got, got moved. Yeah. What happened to the cubs that went into people's homes? You know, they've been placed with other cubs um, at, at the, hit, at the uh, Lyme facility by Ben Killam. It's a nonprofit facility. He's got 60 odd other bear cubs as well. This spring, most of those uh, we'll be putting back out into the wild. Uh, about eight of those are from Vermont, and I'll go and get eight and take them back to Vermont here in just a few weeks. Uh, the remainder are from New Hampshire and maybe a few from Massachusetts, and they'll be released to the wild. That's a neat program. It, it really is. So I'd like to talk about a little bit about bears in general, but I am going to talk a lot about bear-human conflicts because I'm a wildlife manager, and that's the pr number one item that we're concerned about is the growing uh, number of conflicts between bears and, and people. This is the way that most people see wild black bears now is actually out through a picture window, their, their kitchen window of a bear on their lawn that's looking for food in, in their backyard. This wasn't the case 20 years ago. Uh, most of the bears just lived up in the mountains and they did not occur in Heartland and Windsor and Hartford and Springfield had very few bears at all. Um, the people that saw bears were the ones that had hunting camps up in the mountains and, and things like that. Um, and um, our parents and grandparents, if they saw bears, it was usually from visiting an open dump where the bears would come in on, in those towns and stuff like that. But things have changed. Uh, the bear population has increased. Uh, we allowed it to increase um, because the public told us in our management planning that they thought we could handle more bears. But the bears didn't just increase in the mountains, they, they spread out from that, and so twice as many towns now have bears as had uh, bears 25 or 30 years ago. So pretty much throughout the state except parts of the Champlain Valley. This is the animal here. Um, I imagine most of you have seen black bears. Our black bears in New England are the eastern black bear. Uh, they're jet black in color. The only other color you see on them usually is brown on their muzzle. Um, the cubs have brown ear tufts as well. And about a third of the individuals have a white crescent, some kind of white on their chest as well. And I bring up the point that our black bear in New England is black uh, because the black bears that are in the northern Midwest and out west are just as apt to be a blonde color or a brown or reddish hue to them. And there are even white black bears on the Pacific coast in, in some areas. Uh, so black bears are not always black, but east of the Mississippi, they're pretty uniform in color. They, where you find black bears, the populations are different. The behavior is different. Um, and also their size is quite a bit different. And it all depends on uh, what they have for a consistent food source and how people treat them as far as their behavior. Uh, goes. Um, the bear we have in Vermont is a smaller version of the black bear. Uh, adult males will get up to about 300 pounds or so, and the females are about half that size. Once they get over 120, 130 pounds, they have their first litter of cubs, often at the age of five or six, and they just don't grow much after that. All their extra nutrition, their extra energy grows in goes into uh, feeding their cubs, making sure their cubs grow up, and they just don't put on much more weight. So the female is about half the size uh, of the males. Um, an adult female averages 120 to 150 pounds. The number of bears in the state has fluctuated quite a bit. Uh, the early European settlers 
found a fairly large number of bears in the state. Uh, they it kind of had mixed opinions about bears, and that bears uh, were a boon to them, and that for the meat and the hide, um, and also the fat that bears had was very important to the early settlers to help them get through the winter, especially. But at the same time, as they cleared the land and put in crops, and also had uh, different livestock. The bears preyed on the livestock and would eat their crops, and so there was direct competition, and so the people shot bears whenever they could and just tried to eradicate them. But the biggest factor was the clearing of the land. Um, as you probably know, in the early 1800s, sheep was a big industry, especially in this part of the state, but for most of the state as well. And so most all the forest was cleared. Black bears are a forest-dwelling animal, and without the forest, uh, they, the populations decline greatly. With only a few black bears probably up in the very highest mountainous regions, and it was very rare that those were ever seen, and when they were seen, whole, whole towns would turn out trying to kill those. The early, the early Vermonters um, obviously lived with black bears, and probably hunted them to some extent as well, although not very efficiently. Probably the time of year that they could get the most black bears is if they could find a bear den in the winter time, and then a large number of them surround the, the den and, and take a bear at that time. So the bears, early history of bears for most Vermonters was such that the Vermonters didn't really want them here and they actually placed a bounty on them. Right up until the early 1940s, there was a bounty on, on black bears. So it was a bounty at the time where hard cash was hard to come by. They could still get this bounty by turning in a pair of bear's ears. So as time went on, and we actually started to have modern hunting seasons, then the early population of bears, and this was pretty much the case uh, as I was growing up here, and, and most of you in the, in the state of Vermont, the bears were in the mountainous regions, the he most heavily forested blocks, up and down the central part of the state in the Green Mountains, as well as in the Northeast Kingdom, was where our populations of, of bears occurred. And we still have our core populations of bears in those areas. But starting with when we first started to do our management plans, and we went out to the public and asked how many bears people wanted, and the first management efforts that we had, people indicated they, they weren't seeing many bears. They were all in the mountains. They just as soon have more bears. Um, so we allowed that population to grow. And with that, now almost the entire state has black bears in that. And with the problems that come with trying to live with black bears, black bears like to eat the same type of foods we do. They do very good on our garbage. And, and their populations have increased as we've managed them, as the forests have returned to the state. Um, this map is a little bit dated, but it still gives a, the idea of, of how many bears we have. Um, Maine has the largest number uh, in the northeast. They have over 30,000 bears in climbing, um, while Vermont and New Hampshire have somewhere around five to 6,000 bears in, in each of the states. Um, south of us in Massachusetts, the population is growing as, as well, and they've got several thousand uh, bears as well. Um, bears' biggest predators in the controlling factor of their populations are, are people, are, are hunters, and they're actually a tool we use for managing the population. In the state of Maine, where they are kind of dependent on non-resident hunters uh, with black bear hunting, that's where most of the bears are taken, they found they have a limited number of non-residents that come to the state hunt. They can't harvest enough bears to control their population and their population continues to grow. Uh, in Vermont, New Hampshire, we still have uh, a, a culture of hunting enough that we can just adjust our um, season length to take the number of bears that's desired. In Massachusetts, they don't have as many hunters uh, and their population of bears is, is increasing. So who are our bear hunters? Uh, it's mostly people that have grown up in families that bear hunt, that, that continue to bear hunt. Um, 
Some of our other hunters, some of them would like to take maybe one bear in their lifetime, uh, and they do. We find that we've got about 65,000 deer hunters in the state. We find about only a fifth of those are, are bear hunters. Um, but even that number we feel is enough that we can, by adjusting the length of the season, we can actually uh, keep the bear population at a level that we desire it to be at. Bears are one species that we actually manage not on how many the habitat can support as we do with, with moose and with deer, um, but instead it's how many bears will the people tolerate. It, and it, that can fluctuate. Um, if someone gets attacked and injured badly or if there's enough damage goes on or something like that. Um, we've seen states like Florida, which do not hunt bears, suddenly have a season after five people are badly injured by, by bears and, and things like that. Um, so we know in Vermont that people like bears, they like to see them, but there is a, a, a tolerance level. And that's what we, every 10 years we go out uh, and visit and, and try to determine what that number is. With black bears, probably more than most species, uh, their stomach, their appetite d determines their whole world. Um, they're our second largest animal in the state. They're the, the largest carnivore that we have. It takes a lot of energy to keep one of these animals running. Uh, but at the same time, they're not efficient at all at getting food during the winter time. And so they've evolved to actually uh, go into a deep sleep during the winter time, we call it a hibernation. It's not a true hibernation. But for five months of the year, they don't eat anything at all. They're, they're awake some of that time. They cycle in and out of a deep sleep, but they're just laying there wherever they decided to crawl under a fallen tree or some ledges or something. And they're probably thinking about food. Those five months are out there. Um, and when they come out, they might have lost a, a 25 to 30% of their weight. Uh, which is this time of year that they're coming out and they're searching for food. And first thing in the spring, they don't have much to eat. Uh, they're actually uh, classified as a carnivore, but much of the year they're eating vegetation. They're, they're more of an omnivore. They, one type of vegetation they like is clover, also sedges and early grasses they'll eat. Um, and a little bit later, when flowering plants come on, there's some that they like a great deal. Uh, a common one in our woods that is very succulent, they feed on right into the fall, is called jewelweed. And then we've got jack in the pulpit. The corm or root of the jack in the pulpit is almost like a nut. And they like eating that one a lot. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, this is a plant that occurs in rich soils at lower elevations and often around people's houses and stuff. So even when the bear is feeding on a natural food source, it's close to people's houses and can get in, in trouble if it's spotted. Uh, dandelions are favored of bears. Sometimes you'll see mountain fields feeding on that. But they don't put on weight in the spring and early parts of the summer. They're just filling their stomach, surviving until a food source heavy on sugars or starches uh, occurs that they can actually start putting on, on more weight. The first berries, of course, are blueberries and raspberries, and they like those a lot. Uh, it's not until the, the berries that occur in clumps, though, that occur, uh, like choke cherries uh, and blackberries, that they can really start putting on weight. And once this food is available, they go through a process called hyperphagia where they actually feed almost 24 hours a day, just processing berries or nuts just as fast as they can. And of course, it, it's the nuts that they prefer, that are heavy with fats, and they do quite well with. Uh, a common nut, for especially the south half of the state, is acorns. Uh, unfortunately, we primarily just have one oak, and it's a red oak. It's, not, it's kind of a bitter nut, but the bears will eat it. Um, because that's uh, about all it, that they have. Um, they do like meat. They are classified as a carnivore, but they're not good at obtaining meat. And so they'll eat roadkill. They'll um, gut piles from hunter harvested animals. 
and in the springtime they'll actually kill fawns during the month of, of June. But otherwise they're just not good predators. And so they're eating insects like this one down in the bottom corner. Uh, they like carpenter ants a lot um, and they'll feed on that. So this time of year when the bear is coming out, it's a time of wandering starvation for most bears. If the prior year there had been a really good nut crop of beech nuts and acorns, then the bear will go up on those hillsides and do pretty well till, until those nuts are cleaned up. But here in, in Vermont, the food availability for wildlife is, is pretty poor. Um, those of you that pick berries know that only every other year do we seem to have a good berry year. Even our apple crop is lacking some years. And it's the same with nuts. At least every other year there are not very many acorns and the beech nuts seem to occur only about once every three years. So a year like this year, we did not have a good food year last year. There were not hardly any nuts. So a, a bear comes out in the spring and is wandering. So what's it eating as it, it's going through the woods and there's just not much there that's green. The very first grasses and sedges around wetlands are important to bears and they'll feed on them. They'll climb trees like the aspens are starting to get buds out now. They'll climb trees to eat those buds but they're filling their stomachs with plant material and their digestive system is not that of an herbivore, it's the same as humans. Uh, it, we can eat vegetation, eat our salads and stuff, but you're not gonna put any weight on it. And that's what the bears are, are badly trying to do is to put on weight. The females that have cubs need to produce milk for the little cubs or else they starve. So it, it's a tough time this time of year. There is one plant that does not occur in most of the high elevation bear range. In fact, it doesn't occur very much in Vermont. Who knows what this plant here is? Skunk yes, sir. Skunk, Skunk cabbage, that's correct. When I returned from Wyoming after getting a wildlife degree, studying wildlife, and I'd read up a lot on bears, and I did my master's work on bears in the West, my understanding was here in the East, the major spring food for black bears was skunk cabbage. So when I first started the first bear study uh, down in the Stratton area of the state, I just went looking for skunk cabbage and I couldn't find any. <laughs> there were plants that people thought were skunk cabbage. There's a poisonous one called false hellbore that grows along the streams quite a bit, but I just couldn't find that. We just don't have much skunk cabbage in the state. There's a few areas we have some, but not very much. If we did, the bears would actually start gaining weight in the spring. But because we don't, I think this is a major factor why our bears are smaller than the bears in Massachusetts and Connecticut and New York State, and also why they start producing cubs at, at an older age than at those places. It's all because they just don't have this consistent every spring food. What they have instead that they're pretty dependent on is beech nuts. During the years they occur, this little tiny nut um, allows the bears to put on a lot of weight and to go into the den in better condition and for the females um, to actually be able to produce cubs and the cubs survive better in those kind of, of, of years. And one reason why is beech nuts are available in the springtime when there's been a lot of nuts that as they start to germinate the next spring the bears can still feed on them and they produce a lot of energy for the bears at that time. Unfortunately, again, it's every two or three years that, that in between that uh, beech nuts are produced. So the cubs that are produced in between there uh, often die and the females hold off having cubs. So they learn to synchronize having their cubs. We call them cub flush years, where there's more cubs coming into the population every three years or so. So we've put quite a bit of significance on beech trees in, in the state. We know beech trees occur throughout the state. You probably have some on your property. But where the bear go to feed those in remote areas where they feel secure climbing up into the trees where they normally be exposed. So they like to go up on mountaintops. And uh, there are certain areas with a lot of beech trees where we know the bears use them a lot because they leave a lot of claw marks uh, on the trees from climbing up and down. So we actually try to map out these sites and actually try to protect these as much as possible. And we actually had a person I worked with who actually got his master's degree 
on determining the age of bear claw marks on, on trees. And we could actually go in and tell if a, a, a stand of beech was still being used and in what years it got used the most and things like that. So not only for their survival, but how much food they get determines how many cubs and at what age again the female will have cubs, how many litters of cubs she'll have in her lifetime. They normally have uh, cubs every other year with the cubs staying with them for about 17 months, 16 or 17 months. The average number of, of cubs is two that's produced by a female. A uh, female, the first time she has cubs, usually it's just one cub, most often a male. And after she gets more size and she's more experienced and she's heavier and can produce more milk, she has larger litters of cubs. Uh, three is then common for an older female and it's been known where some will actually have four cubs in the state. One thing that Vermont has done in the past, especially when we only had half as many bears, we were concerned because up and down the eastern seaboard, the states were losing their populations of bears at that time. We put a lot of emphasis in protecting bear habitat. And so with our regulatory review process called Act 250 and 248, uh, Myself as a bear biologist, uh, I'm requested and called on to comment about large development projects in the state and how it affects wildlife, including bears. So we actually try to map out those bear clawed beach stands and if there's any way that we can uh, tweak a development project so that it doesn't affect those, we do. Also important travel corridors and crossing areas and also wetlands where the bears first go to, to feed a lot on the green vegetation. So through starting in the 1980s we started to protect bear habitat and we protected through this process over 30,000 acres of, of very important bear habitat in the state. So there's a lot of challenges to managing a bear that's a carnivore, it has long claws, long sharp teeth, um, we grow up innately scared of, in, of bears, the stories we've heard about bears and stuff like that. I think inside we all fear bears a, a little bit. Um, I can tell you now that because it's a hunted population, bears don't want to be around people, but they're strongly drawn to our backyards where there are foods that they really want to get. They do everything they can to avoid people, to coming in contact with people, but at the same time, they like what they find in our backyards. And they like garbage, and they do quite well on garbage. You might have read in National Geographic and stuff about uh, the bears of Yellowstone, where they used to feed them in big garbage dumps, and the bears would come out and, and are attracted to that. People would see them. Uh, but the problem was the bears got so tame that a lot of people were being injured uh, roadside and stuff by those bears. They decided it wasn't good for the bears and they stopped doing that. Um, what they found was the average weight of the bears declined quite a bit after that um, and the population struggled for a number of years till they learned to live in the wild uh, again. And bears are very smart about trying to get our foods that we try to keep away from them. Um, we've always heard you can hang your foods and bird feeders to keep away, keep the bears away, but they somehow uh, find their way still to able to get those. They're very smart. It's one of our most intelligent animals. They learn what day of the week garbage is collected that is going to be sitting outside and stuff like that. In the national parks where the rangers try to keep them away, they learn to uh, recognize the rangers' trucks and take off as soon as they see a ranger's truck and, and things like that. And what we find is one of the first things in our backyards that draws bears, and almost every young bear is tempted when it smells black oil sunflower seed and suet in our backyard, they're tempted to come in and get that, usually at night, and they're very timid the first time they come. And again, it's usually to, to sunflower seed uh, that they're attracted. We call this a gateway drug for the bears. <laughs> It, it's, it uh, enables them to be attracted, and most people, the
the first time a two a bear gets their bird feeder and they actually see a bear, they're thrilled. It's not until they've had two or three bird feeders destroyed and they find uh, that it's creating quite a mess that they are, get concerned. But normally the first time I hear from these people is they take a picture of the bear doing it and, and send it to us asking if we're interested. And I tell you, I'm really sick of photos of bears getting into bird feeders because <laughs> what they should be doing is just uh, giving the bear some kind of negative experience, just hollering at them, telling them they're not wanted. In the bear world, one bear easily scares away another bear, usually a bigger bear, but they just indicate them that they're not wanted. It's their territory. We can do the same thing with our backyard. Just your tone of voice hollering at a bear, a, a bear that just started on this type of life uh, will get the message and, and move on. Um, it's those that have, are more experienced that they have, we have problems with. They don't want to move. I mean, I've yelled at a bear at my birthday before. They just turn around and look at you. Right. <laughs> right. So what do you do then? And that's a bear. Sure. Um, well, that's, that's the big thing. Take down your bird feeders. Make sure there's nothing. If a bear shows up, holler at them. Anything else that you've got on hand would make a loud noise. If it was around the 4th of July, you had any firecrackers or bottle rockets or something like that. Um, if you had a paintball gun or a slingshot, something like that is, is very good. Uh, it's interesting that a bear that's gotten quite a bit of food this way is the most reluctant to leave. Also, the older bears, especially the males, I don't know if it's something they're trying to be macho or what, but they don't like to show that they're scared. So it's not that they're, they don't know you're there or they're not paying attention, but often when you holler at them, they'll just stand there for a while or walk around and then leave. The key thing is they left. It disturbed them and they left. They know you don't want them there. If they're getting a food reward, they'll keep coming back. But if you do that a few times and they're not getting any food anyway, they won't come back. They'll, they'll move on. Yeah. <laughs> a bear's nose is supposedly uh, at least 10 times better than a bloodhound's. And they can smell suet and black oil sunflower seed from well over a mile away probably. So they may be attracted to uh, other plants growing near your house, nearby, along the brook or something, but they can smell that, and they may try to, to get that black oil sunflower seed. The reward is tremendous. Uh, three to five pounds of black oil sunflower seed has more nutrition for them than they could gain foraging in the wild this time of year in a whole day. So you can see where it's very important to bear, and, and they desire very much to come in. Once they start coming in for bird seed, they'll start checking out your backyard for anything else they can find as well. Garbage, pet food, are there chickens, are there beehives, and they'll start checking out the entire neighborhood. And all it takes is one food reward a night that they will continue to work your, your neighborhood. So it's not just a problem you're having, it's a neighborhood problem with that bear. So the best thing is report it, let your neighbors know it's time to take down their bird seed and secure their garbage better. Uh, I think most everybody that raises bees now knows you need to use electric fencing, right, John? Or the, the bears will come in. And actually, it's getting to be the same with chickens. Uh, that the best thing you can do to protect your chickens and keep the bears away is to use electric fencing. It's, it's not so much... Uh, the amount of honey that a bear gets, it, it, it knocking over your hive, you lose your queen, you've lost that hive for the entire year. Um, so it is pretty serious. But again, most beekeepers have learned that electric fencing works. Bears can be quite destructive with that. And once they learn of that food source, it's such a rich food source, uh, often the bear ends up being dis destroyed. So the key is to have that electric fencing up. Uh, and to give them a, a negative experience and they don't continue on with this lifestyle and usually end up getting destroyed. There are a lot of different kits of electric fencing you can use. One that works uh, for beehives as well as for chickens is one of, of this type. Um, 
But sometimes if a bear is able to get through, uh, then it, it'll actually toss hives outside the electric fence and do different things. Uh, the recommendation is to actually put some scent on uh, the electric fencing so when it first gets there, it touches its nose or tongue to it, and that gives them enough jolt they don't continue on with that. Another type of problems that, that bears are, there are big problems with farmers. We don't have many farmers left in the state, and the ones that left try to grow uh, feed corn, and this is probably the most concentrated food source that a bear could ever get. But they know that it's a risky food source. So bears, when they look for food, it's all about quantity, quality, and the amount of risk to get that food. Those are the three things that a, that a bear considers. Interesting enough, it's the most concentrated high quality food a bear could possibly get going into a cornfield and feeding. But it's only in years that the natural food are less available that the bears in the high amounts go into cornfields. So they know the risk is there. The farmer doesn't want them there. He's inviting his friends. They're doing everything. They can shoot those bears and get them out of there. Um, the bears know it, but in some years they, they still go those. Um, someone who has hounds that can chase bears are often highly sought after by those farmers to keep the bears uh, scared out and, and things like that. And they do cause a problem because with the cover that's there, they can just move into cornfield 24 hours a day, just start laying it down, and they do. All the holes and stuff there, they just mat down the corn and, and totally destroy a field and then cause a lot of problems. We don't have a good solution to this yet to help the farmers and stuff. Um, we're going to try more noisemakers. Uh, one thing I want to experiment is with the use of drones, whether or not you could use a drone to fly over a field and see one of those openings with a bear and swoop down and chase it out or not. So we are going to, there's a farmer in Bridgewater who every year has problems with bears because his fields are surrounded by woods where bears live normally, and so the bears easily attracted to his fields. Um, he says that he'll go out of business if he can't do something about the amount of, of damage and stuff, so we're trying to work with him. So once bears start coming to your neighborhood, um, if there's no bird seed, the next thing is garbage. And most people make it pretty easy for the bears to get the garbage. Uh, the bear just walks up to the garbage, especially if it's put out the night before. Uh, so during the, the night time, you'll look out and just see bags of garbage strewn all over while they're in there looking for those chicken bones and T-bone steaks and, and stuff like that. Um, so you can have better containers. You can place your garbage out uh, the, the morning of pickup. You can secure it much better to keep the bears from doing that. The modern dumpsters with the plastic lids are not much at all to keep bears uh, from entering. As I said, bears love garbage. They do very well. Um, your dumpster company has uh, stronger uh, dumpsters. They have ones that metal lid. Uh, they have ones that can, with a metal bar that can be locked down until they come. So there are some that are bear proof or at least bear resistant. A really big bear that's used to getting in is tough to stop and, and it is very much. Uh, but for most of them, we, we can keep the bears out. Uh, dumpsters like that are pretty bear-proof. Uh, ones like this, uh, not so much. One favorite uh, thing of mine is if I get a complaint from a campground or somewhere with his dumpsters, to get an idea of the extent of the problem and who's causing it, it's kind of neat because the bears usually come at night when there's damp vegetation they're walking on, they walk on the gravel, stand up, put their paw on the side of the metal. And you can just go, look, what, what are the size of the paw prints that are there? It tells you if it's an adult, if it's a real large adult. And even the little paw prints down low will tell you it's a female with cubs that you're dealing with. What I especially like to find is fairly small single set of paw prints on it, which means it's one of those juvenile male bears that's just left its mother and trying to get involved. They're, they're easily swayed by a negative experience, and those are the ones we like to try to work with. 
What some uh, subdivisions have done, because uh, we make it a permit requirement now of subdivisions, uh, especially in, in forested areas of some towns, that they have to make sure the bears can't access garbage. So some of them have come up with innovative ways. This is like an old freezer that's padlock shut and they can keep their garbage in there until it's picked up and stuff. And those type of things work. Um, there are more primitive means for keeping bears from getting in. This is a, a bear be gone mat. It, it became famous pretty much up in Canada in Alaska where they've got grizzly bears in remote cabins that they leave for part of the year and the bears would break in and, and just devastate their, their cabins. They found by putting nails and screws uh, in a sheet of ply plywood and putting it down, the bears trying to get up would pinch their paws and that's enough to convince them not to get in. So even something like that works, but you have to be careful that you don't hurt somebody as, as well with it. It seems cruel, but uh, it's better that they actually hurt their paws a little bit than actually to come around those areas where they get hit by cars on the roads or somebody uh, to get rid of them, maybe shoots them or, or something like that. So I mentioned earlier that the juvenile males, those 17-month-old males, are the biggest problems. They're the ones who aren't scared of, of humans yet, and they often will come around, and tentatively at first, they'll be attracted to your backyard. You can tell those because they look like they weigh less than 100 pounds. They look long-limbed, have long ears, and a long, narrow face. Um, and most of those only weigh 50 or 60 pounds, even though with their long hair, that they look more. And they can be easily scared off. Those are the ones that clapping and hollering usually work really well with. Uh, bears are attracted to chickens. Often it's the chicken food and chicken manure, the smell of that, that first attracts a bear. But once it's in there eating the feed, a chicken just sitting there, they'll take it and kill it and feed on it. And they, then they like it, they'll often keep coming back until they're, they're shot themselves. Um, but again, electric fencing works with those kind of bears. Uh, another problem that we have in the state is people that feed bears intentionally. Um, this is the most dangerous thing you could possibly do around bears, is to feed them, purposely feed them, attract them to your backyard, it, you're treating them then like they're a domestic animal, and a lot of people are thrilled by doing that. Um, but they are wild animals, and the, the times there have been quite a few cases around the country where people who feed bears end up being actually killed by bears. Once you feed one, it attracts other bears. You don't know what the history of that other bear coming in is. Um, and if you run out of food too early, as this man did here, this was a bear that he raised. He felt he almost raised, because almost from when it was a cub, it was coming in his backyard. It liked marshmallows a lot. He feed it every day. One day, he ran out of marshmallows too soon, and it put him in the hospital. He nearly lost his arm. They have all the equipment to kill people if they wanted to. Um, people often call us saying a bear was sighted in their neighborhood, their backyard. Now they're afraid to let their kids out. Bears do not want to touch people, be around them. We've never had a case in the state of bears chasing children around, trying to get children or something like that. We've only had one case of anybody actually being killed by a bear, and that was in 1943 in West Townsend when a hunter shot and wounded a bear and then tried to finish it off with his knife, something that's not very smart to do. And the bear actually apparently was just stunned and killed the person and then ran off. And we found that article in an old newspaper and they actually said the hunter liked to actually drink while he hunted. He had a reputation. Anyway, he didn't make very good choices. Uh, but that's the only fatality we know of and the only two cases I know of someone actually getting clawed or bitten in the state were both people feeding bears who'd been warned not to do it and they just kept doing it and they got in a position where that after a while the bears try to break into your house to get the food, go to the source of the food and people at food feed bears often have to barricade their house, put electric fencing around it, they board up their windows and everything else and that was the case 
of the person last year who got bitten. She'd been fined a couple times and warned to stop feeding the bears. And the bears were actually trying to break into her house to get food, and she would try to beat them off with a broom. And one just reached up and got her arm and, and clawed her up. Yeah, that was in Shrewsbury uh, last year. It's actually quite a nice woman. She really likes wildlife a lot. She's an elderly widow. Um, she just can't stop feeding the bears, but maybe now she will since she was injured by them. Um, if you ever travel much and camp much or hike and things like that, then it's, especially in grizzly bear country, you should know everything you can about bears, especially if you're camping out. And what's the difference between black bears and grizzly bear and the behavior? And actually, the best source of information is this. It's got a terrible title, Bear Attacks. Um, but this is a professor, Steve Herrero, from the University of Alberta, actually put together case histories from all the national parks about people that had been attacked by bears, who survived and who didn't, what they did right and what they did not wrong. And he tells you what to do in every situation. If one comes into your camp and, and stuff like that, what you should do. <coughs> so it's actually a very good information source. We also have a wonderful book here produced by wildlife biologists about what to do in any black bear situation where a bear comes into your yard or camp or when you first sight one and things like that. And it's a very entertaining book. It's very good. Uh, it doesn't cost very much. I recommend highly that uh, you encourage your library to get a copy if, if you could. If anyone here works for the library, I'd actually give this copy to them. Do you work? Great. All right. I'll have it for you. Yeah. So, bears in your backyard. This here is a fairly young bear. It's, it's lanky, fairly long-eared, uh, as I said. Um, it's coming onto a, a porch. Um, again, from a window, from your doorway, clapping your hands, hollering it, letting it know it's not wanted is a great thing uh, to do. Uh, one thing, someone actually sent me this picture, and I kept it because I, I just think it's a pretty good picture. And I hadn't noticed till later that over in the corner, there's actually a composter there, a commercial composter, heavy plastic. Uh, we're all being encouraged to start composting now. By 2020, it's going to be required that we have to do something with our kitchen waste besides uh, uh, sending it to, to the dump with our regular garbage. Um, tumblers, are, they're heavy plastic, are actually pretty bear resistant. I'm getting more and more reports of, of bears when they're in someone's backyard uh, going to the composter and causing problems. This is the bear, the, the young yearling, 17-month-old. The expression on his face is he's actually very timid. He did come on your porch, but all you'd have to do is take a step toward him and holler at him, and he's out of there. And that's enough negative experience. He might decide people aren't a good source of food and uh, feed more in the wild and, and things like that. Uh, ben Killam, a behavioralist who has studied bears quite a bit and lives in Lyme, he goes a little further um, my boss tells me I'm not supposed to tell people to do this, but he said in the bear world, one bear will claim dominance over another bear by looking it straight in the eye and then walking at it. Wow. He says, that's what you should do with the bears in your backyard. <laughs> My boss says, I can't tell people to approach bears in their backyard, and I shouldn't. But a young, timid bear like that, they're easily scared away, and you could at least take a step toward it and stomp right from your doorway or something like that, and that, that would scare it away. Something we're hearing m more of, and, and bears have a way of getting in trouble um, and causing problems. Uh, sugar, they're getting to be more and more sugar makers in the state. They're using the sap lines, even the lighter lines than, than this one. In wildlife, like to bite the sap lines. Apparently there's a little leftover sap and stuff in them, and it's something of a problem, and e even with bears, uh, it is. Um, squirrels probably cause the most problem because they'll just take one bite and leave, but even coyotes are, are doing it. So we're starting to get uh, more complaints uh, about that as well. 
If you do a lot of hiking in bear country, especially if, if you uh, visit the national parks where there are brown bears and things like that, the big recommendation now is to carry a can of bear spray on your pack, on your belt, and learn how to use it. You can, there are all kinds of uh, YouTube videos and stuff of, of using bear spray and how it works. It's, it's, it's not mace. Instead, it's, it's developed to hang in the air, to be a cloud, where mace is something that people, you try to spray into the eye of, of people attacking you. Um, with bear spray, you put a cloud between you and the bear, and the bear coming toward you suddenly is overwhelmed by this ground-up capsaicin, which is very powerful. It'll stop a, a charging grizzly bear or polar bear. Uh, with bears in your backyard, it would certainly make you feel comfortable to walk at a bear with that in your hand. And if it took a step toward you, you got close enough to spray it, I would do it. Um, it puts you in command of any situation, if you're in a campground or anything else with as a bear. I give talks to uh, different uh, campgrounds, hiking groups, and I, I tell them that they should all have bear spray and know how to use it. And that way, if there's a bear in the campground, they can approach the bear and drive it out uh, with the bear spray. It, there is a, the right way to use it, and if there's any wind that's blowing toward you, it could be just as much of a problem for you as it is for the bear if you use it wrong. So there, there is a right way to wrong way, but boy, if you've got a lot of bears coming around your house and you've concerned about them, and I've had people say they're afraid to go out after dark and stuff, uh, the big thing is to just make some noise. The bear will move off. It does not want to encounter you either. Um, but if you want to feel safe while you're walking or something like that, then uh, spend $50 on a can of bear spray with a holster, and uh, it, it works. Do you get it at uh, Runnings? Yeah, <coughs> Runnings would have it. Most sports, sports goods stores would, would have that, or you can get it over the Internet. Um, I give this talk quite a bit to the state parks, and just one quick story here. Um, this one park, the Jamaica State Park, was having some problems with a bear. They asked me if I'd come down, I did. And I gave the talk about identifying a juvenile bear, and if it is, to be very aggressive toward driving it off. And at that time, that was enough years ago, I don't think we had bear spray. Um, but I gave the talk, and a few days later, the ranger called all excited, and he sent me these pictures. They had, I'd showed them when I was there about with their dumpster that they had a juvenile bear coming in and they should be aggressive toward it. Well, here uh, the juvenile bear showed up a few days after that. Apparently there was a pie in here on a picnic table. The people ran and got the ranger. The ranger goes, oh, here's our chance. He looked around, what could he have to scare the bear? And lo and behold, oops. He picked up a fire extinguisher and just walked at the bear spraying it. It didn't ever touch the bear, but the sound of it, the yeah. vision of it, the fact that the ranger was aggressive toward it, yeah. scared the bear off, and that took care of their problem for the summer. <laughs> he was pretty proud. The ranger was pretty proud of that. As I mentioned earlier, we do manage bears in the state, and we manage uh, based on the number of animals that the public in general would like to see in, in the state. Of course, you don't know how many bears we have. We estimate that we have between five and 6,000 bears. In our previous uh, management plans, that's been the objective that we set was 4,500 to 6,000 bears. We thought we could keep it in about that range. Um, so every 10 years, we go back out to the public, and we're doing that again now, on how many bears you would like to see out there based on how many you perceive is there now. Do you like the number, apparently, that are there now, or would you want less or more? Knowing that if you had more, uh, that you're going to have more conflicts and you're going to have to learn to live with bears. You, people do, in areas, learn to live with bears. Um, and they're not a problem. You can see more. But again, it's harder to change the behavior of people than it is of bears. In, like in Hanover, the people of Hanover said they wanted to live with that bear, with mink. But there were just so many eggheads out there that wouldn't take care of their garbage, wouldn't take down their bird feeders, that she continued to be a problem, and they finally had to do something about it. Yeah. 
So that's the point we're at now. We've got surveys out there. You might see some hearings, a local hearing where we talk about our big game management plan. We encourage people to come to let us know how they feel about that. Our goal is to have wild bears out there. You know, we have the public lands in the state now. We have over 800,000 acres of public lands. We've got a lot of conserved lands as well, uh, where the bears can be wild. They don't have to come into our backyards. And that, that's our goal, is to have wild bears. I also encourage you, if you have a visit from a bear, to actually get on our website and report it. That allows us to monitor a bear in a community, to assess the amount of risk there is to people and how much damage it's causing, whether or not we have to take any action beside just recommending to people that they <coughs> secure the garbage and take down the bird feeders. It's so it's you can just go to that website. Yes? You say it's per incident, so that there's a problem or just that you cycle? Um, you can do either because it actually has a place on, was this just a sighting or was there any damage or what was the bear doing? The, the best thing for me is as a segment asking to briefly describe what the bear was doing and that helps me know what's, what's going on. If I think there's any uh, risk involved to people, the bears get a little too aggressive, I'll let the local game warden know and if it's certainly a lot of damage occurring, we'll take some kind of management action with that bear. So that's actually the best way to get a hold of us, is to do that. Although if you are scared for your lives for what's happening, call the state police, they'll contact your local game warden, and he'll certainly be there right off. Um, boy, this doesn't show up with green very well, um, but we do plot the uh, reports we get from the public, and we found this clusters of, of these uh, up in the Montpelier, Barry, Warren, Faston area, we have the largest number of people reporting problems with, with bears. Uh, another big problem area for us is Killington, uh, the resort areas. You might even seen uh, it made international news where bear walked down a hotel lobby <laughs> at, at Killington this last year. Uh, they'd been getting into the dumpster quite a bit, and one wandered inside the building and, and stuff. I actually had a call from England where they wanted to do a report on that bear after they'd seen it. They wanted to do a story on it and stuff like that after. Um, so we keep track of these areas, and what we're trying to do is we've got a list of about eight communities in the state that have large numbers of bear issues. And so I'm working with our outreach department, with our game wardens, to try to uh, do more information sessions with those towns. And the closest one to here is going to be Killington. I'm going to be working with the town of Killington and, and stuff with that. So with that, if there are any questions, we'll answer those. Yes, Elaine. I know it's a problem with the grizzlies up west. Is it a problem with keeping food in your car, or they have to <coughs> write your car getting into food? Um, I wouldn't store food in your car if you had anything else you could do. If the bear's already coming into your yard expecting to get food and the only place is in your car, it will try to get into it. Um, there was a story of a man in Barter who had not seen any bear and wanted to and heard there was some in the neighborhood, so he started putting uh, food on his deck to try to attract it so he could see it, uh, but it, he also had left some in his car and he had a BMW and a bear came and actually wrecked his car trying to get into it. So yeah, the bears learn uh, in Yosemite Park, they used to tell them to store food in, in your car and bears would learn to break out the back window to get into your car. So now they recommend you actually not store food there and you roll your windows down. So. Yeah. Um, so instead, uh, put it in a shed. If you've got uh, garbage, a lot of it or something, we store uh, uh, some kind of lock box, a truck box, or something like that certainly would be good at storing it. Yes? Any other questions? If not, thank you for coming. Yeah, I've got information up back and stuff, some flyers. Yes? Not really a question, but I'm working on trying to get um, neighborhood or community composting 
in advance of this and am in touch with somebody who knows how to do it without attracting bears. So if anybody wants to come to me and oh, great. give an email, I can get in touch with you. Wonderful. You know, I, I'm very uh, interested in composting. I've been attending some of, some of the meetings with DC and, and uh, the, the different communities and stuff on that. And there's a right way and a wrong way to compost around wildlife. And if you do it wrong, just putting stuff out in your backyard, you're going to attract skunks and raccoons and rats and all kinds of stuff. And that is being done around the state that way. So there, if you're going to start composting, you don't already... Uh, there is information out there about how to do it right. Uh, the big thing is to not put the real smelling material in and to use a lot of dry material as you're supposed to with composting anyway to, to mix in. And if you do it right, there's not much smell at, at all. Mm -hmm. Yes. With, yes. Yeah, picking up on it, we're actually together. Um, I compost everything that's compostable with three exceptions. Um, chicken and bones, meat and fat, and they're just stored in the in the freezer until I go to the garbage pickup. I don't have it picked up, so it's never outside. Good for you, and that's something that uh, a lot of people not may not realize. But when you go to your local transfer place, there is a can there for that material. Just Actually, there in. isn't. That's the problem. And I, I go to Weathersfield. To Hartford. I, I, uh. I, the Heartland Fire Station won't take it. It just goes in the dump truck with the trash. Um, and knowing that it's coming up next July, um, a year from July 2020, um, I actually start, stopped by Hartford Big Center and I said, do you have a place for these three compostable organic things? Um, I am concerned, I have seen a bear in my area, so I'm very careful to try not to attract them back. Mm. And I Good. just, I saw it outside the kitchen window and I simply tapped on the window as hard as I could and it disappeared and it probably was pretty small so it could have been a juvenile yep. never seen it again uh, i also took the bird feeder in that day um, <laughs> and now take it in in april uh, early april yeah. and um you're saying all the right am, things here <laughs> you're saying all the right things I'm but, but i am really hesitant to put those three what i consider to be invitations into the compost compost heap and that's the chicken right the bones and skin and fat. And so I'm still taking this to the garbage and we at Heartland and everybody else gonna have to figure out how to do that. But you had you you talked that one picture of the bear coming up your deck steps. Um, you said that the tumbler, heavy black plastic tumbler composters, I've never gone in for that. Um, but they are mostly bare. See, I don't want to start that outside because I almost think it's like putting out an invitation. Right. And once they learn that there's something in this area, they're going to come back to look for it again. There's no smell. So, yeah. are there really bear-proof tumblers? There, there actually are. There's one that's made, I think, in Sweden. It's made of metal. It's, do you know the name of that one? I can't I, think of it. I, learned it like I, I just gave a presentation. I had one yeah. picture of it, too. Yeah, I'm sure it's the same, same one. Yeah, there, there are some, but they're expensive. Most people starting compost won't, won't want to spend that much. Yeah. $250 for one that would service 10 families. Is yeah. what no, I think it's point. easier for the towns to do it in bulk. Yeah. My other question was, I was very interested, you're saying that you know chickens will attract the bears. And my question originally, in, earlier in your talk was, is it the chickens or the feed? Subsequently, you answered that question and actually said, it's the chicken, it's the feed and the manure. Right. So all my chicken manure goes in the compost heap. So I, am I, in fact, putting out an invitation by dumping all the, the chicken manure if, in the If compost? you're using enough dry material in yeah, there, it, the, it shouldn't be much scent. Right. Um, and I think kind of a rule of thumb to go by, if, if you hear a bear in your neighborhood, that's something you should share with your neighborhood if mm -hmm. you've got to visit. Because a bear can go five miles in a night checking every backyard. Yeah. So um, share it with it. If you hear of one in your neighborhood, that's a time to look in your backyard and say, what possible smelly things? Do you it's a good time to mix in dry leaves and, yeah. and more dry stuff with you. Yeah. But there are, um, I'm just learning about composting myself. And I took a class last year and stuff and learned a lot. And then I've been working with the people that put the material out about it as well because I, I wasn't satisfied with what I heard at the class. 
they kind of discounted problems with wildlife and I said, but I'm getting a hundred calls now. In the last three years I've got a hundred calls from people with problems with bears and composting so I know it's a, a, a problem and stuff. Um, so some of the heavy plastic ones that are cheaper are at least bear resistant. Uh, everything but a real big bear it probably keep out of. Uh, and a lot of them will screw in or something like that. One thing that would not stop a bear is the uh, square ones that are very light plastic. A bear could just knock those over. And unfortunately at the class I took, they were promoting those and even selling them at a discount out back. And I said, boy, that's not going to, that's no problem for a, a, a bear. But the big thing is just to do it right, there's almost no odor. Yeah, being careful again what you put in and how you do it. Uh, down here. May I ask, please, how old bears get to be and when do the females stop producing babies? Well, um, it's not an easy thing to answer. Our oldest bear that we know of, that we had in our bear harvest, because we pull a tooth and age <coughs> each one, was 39 years old which matches the national record for the oldest bear to be in the harvest. But most bears in the wild, their dentition breaks down, their, bear, their teeth get badly worn or broken uh, by the time they're 15 or 20. So they usually don't live much past their 20s. But bears in captivity, like if you've ever been to Clark's Trading Post, where Bears are raised up from cubs there. They train them to play basketball and stuff like that. They feed them dog food and stuff, softer food, and their bears live into their 40s. So they can live longer, uh, but in the wild, it's a rough life, and they, they normally don't. A female will have cubs, boy, probably until she's 20 or, or so. And that last 10 years is probably when she's the most productive as well. If she's bigger, she's more savvy, she probably has more cubs that survive. Yeah. How old is yes, sir. Is, is there ever, is there, I, I haven't heard of this myself, but I've never even seen a bear in a while. Is there a problem with bears attacking household pets? I'm thinking specifically dogs. Um, I haven't heard any cases of bears attacking cats, but bears are ancestral enemies to all canids, including wolves and coyotes and dogs. Uh, wolves, I'm sure, could kill uh, many uh, bears, especially a pack of wolves could. And historically, they probably pulled them out of dens and stuff like that and killed them. I saw a film one time of a female with cubs crossing a meadow, and a pack of coyotes ran up, and one distracted the mother, and another one grabbed the cub, and they, they ran off so they can actually Kill them for you. So bears dislike dogs and coyotes and everything quite a bit. Um, uh, bears are also hunted with hounds some, uh, which actually keeps them more wary of people and stuff we think it, it does that. Um, so they don't like dogs. So if you own a dog in your backyard, you probably help keep bears away. Uh, but at the same time, bears can be really irritated by dogs, especially yapping dogs. You know, the little yapper dogs? Uh, three or four years ago, we actually had three different dogs that were killed by a bear. I had not known it to happen, and I haven't heard of it since. Um, but they're all cases where a small dog ran barking up to a, a bear and jumped at it, and the bear just killed it. It wasn't attacked by the bear, but it was killed by the bear. Um, so it, it can happen. Uh, a few weeks ago in Hartford, in, in Queechee, that I think Tall Timbers campground, a mobile campground, there was someone who left their dog in their car while they went inside somewhere. Bear apparently came by and the dog barked at it and the bear smashed out the windows. Wow. It didn't, the bear was, uh, the dog was cowering in the bottom of the car when she came back out. Uh, the bear was, was gone. And we're watching that very closely. If that bear does any other damage, then we may take that bear and, and remove it. Um, but it apparently hadn't been a problem since. I haven't heard any more reports. And interesting, and it's good to bring that up about dogs, because hiking with dogs or 
it, it can be a dangerous situation, even more so in grizzly bear country, but also black bear, in that a dog that sees, a, say, a sow with cubs on the trail ahead of will run, often run up barking at it. To protect her cubs, the sow will run and chase the dog. The dog comes back at its owners. And there have been cases where people have been injured by the bear. Not usually killed, but bitten or scratched by that bear. In, in fact, 75% of the cases in that book of people being injured by bears involve dogs. So if there's bears in an area, there's a lot of berry patches or something along a trail, one recommendation is either don't take your dog with you or take it on a leash or just have it under control. Um, and it, you don't want it running out of bear because it can cause a lot of issues for you. Yeah. Why is it safe to um, put your bird feeders back out? It's safe to put your bird feeders back out after the first heavy snowstorm that stays on the ground. Uh, we use the date of December 1st, but actually if there's no snow on the ground at that point, it could still be bears out and out. When did the bears start hibernating? The bears start hibernating uh, when they can't get food very much in the fall. In years like this last year, where there were almost no nuts available and very few apples, uh, the female bears, which are the first one to enter dens, the females that are going to have cubs, they find a good den and enter first. Uh, they'll den as early as October. In this past year, a lot of them did. Uh, the male bears will stay out longer, usually until that heavy snowfall. Um, in a year, that there are a lot of beech nuts and acorns, the bears will try to stay out, even if there's six inches of snow, they might be out feeding on them. Yeah, so it all depends on whether or not they're able to get food. Yeah. And the first bears out in the springtime are the male bears. If a female has cubs, then those cubs are so small and fragile that she'll stay near her den and not move much. While a male will come down, those are the ones you see your feeders in April and stuff are, are male bears. Mm -hmm. While a female is sticking close to her den. Mm -hmm. yeah. a, a female now, uh, probably even now, has not moved very far from her den. She might go 100, 200 yards, always keeping a big tree that's easy to climb very close by because the cubs can climb up when she tells them to and stuff. But coyotes, foxes, fisher, bobcats, could easily kill those cubs at this point. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. You've been a good crowd. I've enjoyed it.